everyone. Welcome to the Injury Prevention Research Center at Emory's webinar on intimate partner violence in the time of a pandemic. I am Sharon Neeb, iPrice Program Director, and I will be your host and moderator for the webinar. iPrice is a CDC-funded injury prevention research center, and our goal is to reduce the top causes of injury and injury death in Georgia and the Southeast through impactful research, education, and outreach. Before we begin with the panel, I want to let you know this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website and social media platforms. Now, I would like to introduce the members of the panel. Dr. Gabney Evans is an Associate Professor of Global Health and Behavioral Sciences in the Rollins School of Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Evans. Dr. Michael Cleary is an Assistant Professor, Department of Emergency Medicine at the Emory University School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Cleary. Dr. Dominic, Dominic Perrot is a Professor of Psychology and Director of the Center for Research on Interpersonal Violence in the Department of Psychology at Georgia State University. Welcome, Dr. Parat. Before we get started, I would like to go over the format of the webinar. Each panel member will be provided approximately five to seven minutes to speak, which will be followed by questions to individual panel members. We plan to save 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for the panel to answer questions submitted by the audience. Your mics will be muted throughout the webinar, so please submit your questions through the chat box. Now let's get started with the panel's presentation. Dr. Dabney will now begin her presentation. Thank you so much, Sharon, and good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here and I'm grateful for all of the attendees that have joined us this morning. Um, so I wanna give a little bit of an overview of intimate partner violence, and then talk about the ways in which COVID-19 might be affecting it. Um, also, you can feel free to tweet at iPrice and at Dabney Evans if you have questions or wanna raise awareness about this, um, this talk today so that others can be aware. Next slide, please. So a little bit about what we know about intimate partner violence before the pandemic. We know that um, there really is what we call a shadow pandemic of violence against women and girls. So globally, one in three women will experience physical, sexual, or psychological violence in her lifetime. And each year, at least 50,000 women are killed by their partners, and this is probably a vast underestimate. In the US, nearly 20 people every minute are physically abused. So by the end of this hour together, more than 1,200 people will have been affected by intimate partner violence. And prior to the pandemic, Georgia ranked 10th in the nation for the rate at which women were killed by male partners. Next slide. So as I mentioned, intimate partner violence and violence against women more broadly is sometimes called the shadow pandemic. And that's because we know that it's happening at a vast scale and has been happening before COVID, as I just mentioned. We also know that the pandemic has brought on new circumstances. So we have movement restrictions um, that are designed to protect public health and justifiably so and to reduce disease transmission, but that those restrictions on movement may be causing tensions and stresses, and that they may be placing um, undue stress on people that are experiencing violence or maybe even triggering violence within their relationships for the first times. So there are no systematically collected data on the reactions or the interactions between COVID-19 and intimate partner violence, but what we do know from some anecdotal reports is that one city in China had reported a twofold increase in IPV cases in one month following movement restrictions, that femicides, that is the gender-based murder of women, has doubled in Sao Paulo, Brazil in a one month period. And here at home, the Atlanta Police Department reported a 42% increase in domestic violence crimes during the pandemic period. So these data seem to suggest that there is a relationship and that violence may be exacerbated by the pandemic but again, we don't have any systematically collected data at this time to say exactly what the relationship between these two things is. Next slide. 
The good news is that there is some global guidance. And so these are some of the major international organizations that have issued guidance, including the World Health Organization that's talking specifically about addressing the issue I just mentioned on data collection. UN Women has called for increased support for um, financial support for support services like shelters and domestic violence agencies, as well as psychosocial support and guarantees against impunity. So for example, um, allowing courts to continue in virtual or digital spaces. UNICEF, which is focused on children, has issued guidance on remote data collection, so how we can collect data during this period and ethical considerations for doing so, given that people's safety may be at risk. Unfortunately, there's no federal guidance at this time. So CDC has not issued any guidance specifically looking at the intersection of COVID-19 and IPV. And the Department of Health and Human Services has general COVID-19 guidance for human services program providers and for state and local governments, but nothing specific to IPV. Next slide. So I wanna zero in and spend the remainder of my time talking about what we can do. And the most important thing that I wanna underscore is that regardless of what position you're in or what kind of agency you might work in, or even if you're just an individual attending this session, there are always things that can be done. So I'm not gonna spend time going through each of these things, but if you wanna take a second to just look at where you might fall within this slide, um, and then you can think about what some of those actions might be for yourself. But what I wanna do for the remainder of the time is I wanna spend time focusing on real-time tools that can help women or people who may be at risk of violence in their relationships. Next slide. So I wanna point out two tools that can be used by people to assess the amount of da um, danger or violence potentially in their relationships. So the first is a tool called the danger assessment. This is a calendar and a validated 20 item scale that's available online. I've listed the website there. And it has been adapted for same sex couples and into many languages. And there's also a version for immigrants. Um, the, the version that I've mentioned here, which is the sort of default version is focused on women experiencing violence at the hands of men. So as I mentioned, it's a 20 item scale. And after completing this scale online, women can have a sense of how much immediate danger they may be in. This is really a risk assessment for femicide. So that's a freely available tool online. Next slide. The other tool that I wanna point out is actually an app, a, a smartphone app. It's available in all app stores and it's called My Plan. It is a mobile safety planning app and it's secure. And what I mean by that is it has um, a cover that doesn't talk about what the app is actually about. So it sort of gives a false um, read on what the app is about. It looks like a cooking app and it is password protected in order to get in. But it offers um, people, the danger assessment is embedded within this tool so people can do a femicide risk assessment and they can also make plans for their own safety and what they might do if they find themselves in a dangerous situation. Next slide. And these are my references. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dabney, for that informative presentation. Next, we will have Dr. Michael Cleary. Dr. Cleary. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Evans. That was so helpful and very informative. Um, I apologize to everyone for not having my camera on. I, I'm not the best at scheduling, and so I had a dental surgery and I'm a little bit deformed this morning. Um, but what I would like to share with you all is essentially the clinical perspective um, from uh, the emergency department during uh, the pandemic and how we saw some fluctuations and some challenges to respond to in the setting of COVID. Um, this is a little bit less data centric, just essentially due to uh, being early in this process and not having a data collection or um, publication uh, uh, designed for this. But um, I do think that what I would like that what people can take away from this is a real look at um, what the um, real time effects were as we walked through this. So from the patient perspective, when they come into the ER, there are typically two different pathways in which we encounter domestic violence. In one, the patient is injured, so they're presenting for an acute injury, such as in the trauma center. There's a second type of way we find patients, and that's typically through screening or paying attention to some red flags, where there's just a clinical gestalt, um, 
or the patient discloses in another um, type of medical presentation, whether they're there for um, sexually transmitted infection testing or another type of medical complaint where they disclose domestic violence. Um, what are, uh, I guess, anecdotal uh, consensus was as providers was we felt like we were seeing an increase in the volume of injured patients However, um, the second type of just the screening patients was not necessarily uh, uh, as elevated in the acute setting of COVID. What that meant for us is we really want to find a safe disposition for patients when they get to the end of a clinical encounter. So going from our ER, where can they go where they can be safe? And luckily there are a number of community partners that do have shelter resources in the area. Um, there's at least one in every single county and we have a long history of partnering with them for our patients' needs. As you all, I'm sure, are aware, they also are struggling with the um, setting of the pandemic. So in addition to our uh, assessment that we were seeing increased numbers of patients, they were also having to socially distance within the shelters, which decreased the available number of beds that were available. We also don't know, because um, unfortunately we haven't really studied or dug into it yet, but there is a possibility that uh, the most common disposition for our patients is that they go somewhere safe, like a family member's or a friend's house. Um, and in a setting where everyone is socially distancing and, they're trying, and trying to um, quarantine within a smaller group of contacts, there's also a possibility that that option was decreased. So we were getting to the end of clinical encounters and finding that patients simply didn't have a safe next step. Um, and what that challenged us to do is to create um, a clinical pathway. So I have a remarkable um, co-faculty member, uh, Liang Lu, who set up a CDU protocol within our observation medicine part of the ER, which essentially gave us a full 24 to 48 hours to help patients who otherwise didn't have a safe disposition. Um, it gave our social workers and our team a time to find those limited resources that were out there or allow patients to really like coach them and um, help them make contact with family members that may even be out of state. So um, the flexibility on our ED leadership's uh, team has, has really allowed us to um, extend ourselves more. In addition, uh, we had a great opportunity to be proactive. And what this did is it really put a, uh, a light on it within our department. So as more and more people noticed that um, we weren't comfortable with what was available for our patients, there was an ability to reach out on our department's behalf to the Women's Resource Center in the city. Um, so this Women's Resource Center to End Domestic Violence. And they have been able to designate specific resources to safely um, provide a next level of essentially social work services to find either hotel rooms temporarily um, for patients and their families or make those uh, travel arrangements for patients who may need to leave the city. Now, the other thing, and this is not to um, be cast a negative light at all. What I think that this is really done in an uncomfortable way, both for me as a provider and for our system, is just recognize the ways in which these s services that are so necessary often do have um, uh, cracks through which a lot of our patients fall. It's really difficult. Um, and the patient experience often isn't what we design it to be. Um, and having to kind of dig in and think about what our patients actually encountering um, has been really challenging, but also a great opportunity to look at where we can expand our services and uh, even on the other side of COVID, create um, a clinical experience that is more safe and has more opportunities for the patients. So um, we tried to do a quick survey of like, what are the beds even available in the city? And if someone had called any of the shelter hotlines during uh, just independently on their own, they would have been told that there were no shelter beds available that day. We had to essentially create like a short circuit from the ER in order to get past that just because resources are so limited. Um, 
And the, um, what that shows us is that there's probably a, a good opportunity to, in some way, aid that process so that way patients aren't um, calling from our ER and experiencing a repeated trauma of being told that there's just nothing available um, or that they need to describe their situation over and over again to multiple different locations only to find no help. Um, it also has opened up uh, some future opportunities in terms of developing uh, clinical expertise and services for really complicated patients. Um, one of the other areas in which I work is in human trafficking screening. And oftentimes what we see is that there's a lot of um, uh, co-diagnoses for these patients, which often include some version of substance use or abuse, um, as well as some versions of coercive sexual uh, uh, relationships. So the, it is not uncommon that one of the ways in which a patient is experiencing abuse is through a partner who is forcing them to do sex work. And these types of patients um, present to us additional challenges just in making sure that all of those components of risk and potential injury to the patients can be fully addressed um, rather than sending them to services that may be not completely uh, able to meet their needs. So in summary, what I would say is that this has been an, a very challenging time that showed to us the ways in which our services that are dedicated and designed and are full of passion, people who want to help people may um, leave cracks through which patients fall. It shone a light on it. It gave us an opportunity to be challenged by that and face some of our failures in order to create um, a drive and some now new opportunities going forward. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, specifically about that component of uh, the care during COVID-19. Thank you, Michael, for that informative presentation. Next, we will have Dr. Parat provide his presentation. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to use my time today to discuss some data we collected just this past April. Uh, and before I get into it, I want to uh, acknowledge my co-authors on that project, uh, Cindy Stappenbeck, who's an associate professor at Georgia State and a faculty affiliate in the Center for Research on Interpersonal Violence, and Miklos Hamos, who's a, a senior graduate student in our um, doctoral student in our community psychology program, who's also a student affiliate of our center. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a sample of media reports collected by the Georgia Commission Against Domestic Violence that they posted on their website. Uh, these reports and many others that, that I'm sure you've all seen call attention to the fact that uh, women who are living with abusive men are at a major risk of victimization during COVID-19. Um, and uh, through, you know, from mid-March uh, into early April, we were, we were monitoring these reports and, and wanted to collect empirical data uh, to answer the basic question of whether or not IPV uh, increased during these quarantine and shelter in place restrictions. Um, certainly the reports we were hearing suggested they were, but we wanted to get systematic uh, empirical data on this. And if there were increases, we wanted to know what might be driving those increases. And our focus was on what we call pandemic stress as well as alcohol use. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, regarding stress, you know, an essential component of the public health response to COVID-19 uh, has been a focus on social distancing. Uh, and these efforts, which again include quarantines, uh, shelter in place restrictions, school and business closures, et cetera, have led to really significant economic, social, and personal stressors for people. Um, now, if you look in a related area, natural disasters, for instance, in the aftermath of, let's say, a hurricane, we, we know from, from systematic data that people are at greater risk for violence when they experience stressors that are kind of economic, social, and personal in nature. So the point here is that we're seeing, I think, a lot of the same things with this pandemic. So it really stands to reason that people who experience more of these stressors uh, in these domains are going to be at greater risk for violence. Um, and so given these data, a fundamental premise of our study was that this stress that people are experiencing, which we termed COVID-19 stress, uh, 
was going to be associated with IPV perpetration. And just to be clear, we're going to be focusing on perpetration in this particular, in my comments here today. Uh, next slide. So our, our two basic research questions were, uh, does the research evidence support the anecdotal and media reports that we're hearing? Are we seeing increases in IPV perpetration as a result of the pandemic? And uh, relatedly, we were also kind of interested in whether we would see increases in people's alcohol use as well. And secondly, you know, if there's an increase in IPV, is there an association between the stress that people are experiencing, again, this COVID-19 stress and IPV perpetration? And is that in any way associated with alcohol use or how does alcohol use play into that? Next slide, please. So what we did was recruited 510 participants from across the United States using an online research panel between April 16th and April uh, 22nd uh, of this year, really during the height of the quarantine and shelter in place restrictions and before any states really started to quote unquote open up again. The eligibility criteria were pretty minimal uh, and all participants had to report being in a relationship in the past six months and, in, and currently in a relationship that had lasted for at least six months. Uh, our sample was roughly split in terms of their self-identified sexual orientation uh, that was purposeful on our part. There's some racial ethnic diversity in the sample, but the panel was predominantly white. Uh, and you can see that most people were with their current partners for approximately 11 years. Uh, now, the basic idea in our method was because we couldn't uh, conduct a prospective longitudinal study because the pandemic onset had already started uh, after mid-March, we kind of did the next best, one of the next best things was to look retrospectively, uh, where we asked people about their alcohol use and IPV perpetration in the six months prior to the onset of the pandemic, which is roughly the middle of March. And then we asked them the same questions at the time of the survey, which was roughly in the middle of April. So we could uh, kind of get uh, at their alcohol use and IPV in that month since the COVID onset, uh, and then kind of compare those two time periods and to see if IPV and also alcohol use changed as a result of the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So what this table is showing uh, is that uh, essentially it's, it's showing the data from our study that in fact IPV and alcohol use have increased during the pandemic. Um, all of these effects are statistically significant, uh, but what I think is more important to focus on at least at this moment is the size of these effects and I'll try to orient you to this slide. The first two rows focus on physical IPV perpetration and then psychological IPV perpetration. And if you look, for example, at the first row of physical IPV, those very tiny numbers in the pre-COVID and during COVID numbers, so that 0.0059 and 0.0416, that's the rate of IPV perpetration per day. Uh, we needed to calculate it in that way because the pre-COVID period was six months and the during COVID period was approximately one month. But if you take that rate of, of IPV and extrapolate it out over the course of 365 days, essentially, making the assumption that that rate remains consistent for a full year. Pre-COVID, people were reporting about 2.2 acts of physical IPV per year. During the one month after COVID onset, that increased to 15.2 acts of physical IPV per year. Uh, that's, that's pretty sizable. In terms of psychological IPV, we went from 15.9 acts per year, or roughly a little over one act of psychological IPV per month, to 96.7 acts per year. That's about um, eight per month or uh, about twice a week. Um, so again, th these are pretty Im important and sizable effects. Uh, in terms of drinking days per week, the number of drinks people drink on a typical drinking day, that also increased from pre-COVID period to uh, post uh, onset of COVID in mid-March. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, relates to our second research question around COVID-19 stress, and it depicts the association between that stress and physical IPV perpetration in heavy drinkers who are depicted by that orange line and non-heavy drinkers who are that depicted by that blue line. And I'll try to break down these results uh, real quickly here. To start, there was what we call a main effect of stress. In other words, regardless of people's level of drinking, Higher levels of COVID stress were associated with more physical IPV perpetration post-COVID onset. But just to keep that in perspective, relative to the stress effect, there was a much stronger effect of heavy drinking. 
Um, so people who drank more were uh, perpetrating much more IPV. What the data tell us though, that's really interesting, I think, is in whom this COVID stress is associated with IPV. If you look at the orange line, again, this, these are our heavy drinkers. COVID stress was not associated with IPV for these individuals. That line's pretty flat. There's no association there. And I'll conclude, this is because people who are heavier drinkers, that, that their heavy alcohol use is really compromising their ability to inhibit uh, urges to aggress. And so even minimal conflicts or, tr or, or triggers, regardless of, of COVID stress, is probably going to be at high likelihood of leading to IPV. So those folks are kind of at high risk already, uh, regardless of COVID stress. What's interesting here, I think, is our non-heavy drinkers. Uh, so again, depicted by that blue line. These are folks for whom we're seeing an effect of pandemic stress on their IPV perpetration. These are folks who do drink alcohol, but not at, at heavy levels, at, at much lower levels. And we see that if their COVID stress is low, their rate of IPV is, is fairly low as well. But as that stress increases, as people experience more pandemic-related economic, social, and personal stressors that are difficult to cope with, we're seeing an increase in their IPV perpetration. Uh, next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, our data suggests that IPV has, been in has increased as a result of the, of the pandemic. Um, and it's also suggesting that you know, we know that people are experiencing a lot of stress during this time, and, and some surely more than others. Uh, and our data suggests that this stress is at least one of the factors that's driving this increase in IPV perpetration. Um, and, and, and maybe even more importantly, I think what we're seeing in these data is that people who might engage in IPV relatively infrequently, or, or maybe even not at all, are now in this really historic time, uh, you know, they're being pushed to the brink in a lot of different ways. Maybe they lost a job, uh, maybe their elderly parent contracted COVID, or maybe they know someone who died from COVID. Perhaps they're really socially isolated, or they don't have childcare or healthcare, or maybe they have a health condition that makes them vulnerable uh, to COVID, but, but they're an essential worker, or they don't have uh, uh, a paid leave, and so they have to go to work. Um, they're experiencing everything uh, that we kind of see in this word cloud that I put up here, and they're now finding themselves uh, experiencing all this stress. And it's, and it's, I think, spilling over, if you will, for people into their relationships in the form of uh, intimate partner violence. And I'll end there, and, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Parat, for your very informative presentation. Next, you will notice on our screen that there is a resource slide. And that includes information and research, resources the, present, the presenters have shared with us. The information will be sent to you after the webinar is completed. Thank you again, um, panelists, uh, for your very informative presentations. Now I would like to begin with the individual questions. And the first question is for Dr. Evans. How are Black women and other women of color affected differently by IPV? and by the intersection of the two. Thank you so much. I think this is a really important question and a really timely question. Um, and I hope that I can speak to it and give it justice. Um, so I think it's really important for us to recognize the risk of violence that black women face generally in our society because of social factors, including racism and police violence, which is something that we're all aware of right now. If we zero in on intimate partner violence and think specifically about Black women, um, Black women, about 40% of Black women will experience domestic violence in their lifetime. So that number is higher than the number that I mentioned previously, one in three women. And I think that there are a number of factors that play into that, including social factors like racism, but also other things, including socioeconomic status, unemployment, and many other disparities that we see when we compare the black community to white communities or other, um, other breakdowns by race and ethnicity. Um, one of the things that we need to consider at the individual level is that women may not feel comfortable calling the police. And I think that um, we don't have to think very hard to understand why black women may be hesitant to call the police. Um, the police may not be a place where they can get help. And so there is a real concern about interacting with the criminal justice system especially if their partner is a black man where there are also risks for them. But um, just to underscore score this disparity, black women are about three times as likely to be murdered 
as white women. So when we think about how we want to address intimate partner violence, we definitely need to take these racial differences into mind. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, that was a great answer to the question. Next, the second question goes to Dr. Cleary. What patient population faces the greatest barriers for placement with community partners? Oh, thank you. Um, so I think the phrasing of greatest barriers, uh, it's again, more of the anecdotal experience from our ER and our projects from human trafficking and domestic violence. Uh, the things that we really run into are those um, co-diagnosis patients that we that I spoke about at the end, just in terms of having um, programs that are available that are able to um, treat both substance use disorders or deal with the effects of possible withdrawal and some um, clinical monitoring in the setting of also getting to a safe place um, for uh, that that is away from a, an abusive partner um, so that those are the ones that i think uh, use a lot of resources from the er side and really a, a lot of um, effort from our community partners who are wonderful um, i also do want to take a moment just to respond uh, to Ms. Frioff's uh, comment in the chat line, um, because I want to make sure that I'm really clear about uh, what I'm trying to say about this process. Because like she said about the uh, Partnership Against Domestic Violence, they have been open and working incredibly hard this entire time, and they are doing a wonderful, incredible, and a very important work. Um, and that's where I want to refocus from there are so many people doing incredible, very important work, and these partners have been heroes. What I am challenged with is what is my ER's patient's experience getting to that? And there are many links in the chain getting them to connect. And how do I improve and address the, those challenges, specifically you know, when we run into patients who do have these uh, um, additive barriers? How do, we, how do we work through that chain so that people don't fall off or slip through cracks? So again, not to reflect on any of the, um, the actual service providers, but more on that, the patient experience through the process. So Dr. Cleary, I just want to add one clarifying question to that. So um, you're um, believing that it's difficult sometimes to, to know that beds are open. Has that been a problem? So, yeah, so the experience is if a patient calls a line, the, the, um, the intake line, I had, so what we did is we tried to do a, a, a simulation of this where medical students called to see if there was a bed available. The, there was never a bed openly available. What that does not reflect is that there were that the domestic violence agencies don't go above and beyond to place patients. Um, so if, so if I, so I called and talked to the leaders from all of the different local organizations and they without fail said, if you call me, let me know, we will go, we will move mountains to help you. So what my challenge is, is to um, move past the initial um, experience of calling the hotline and to the connection to those, um, those resources. So right so, now, the patient experience of it from the ER side is what we are trying to improve. Okay, so it's, it's, it's connecting with the individuals. Thank you very much with the individual community partners. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'm going to go to question three. The third question goes to Dr. Parat. People don't become violent every time they drink alcohol. Given that, could you tell us more about how alcohol contributes to the perpetration of IPV? And in particular, could you tell us more about who's at risk? And what does that tell us about who is at risk for IPV during a pandemic? Yeah, this is, um, I think this question kind of underscores the, the, just the sheer complexity um, in the alcohol violence relationship because, 
Uh, I think we're all would generally agree that alcohol um, uh, is associated with violence. There's a lot of data over decades to show that alcohol is actually a contributing cause of violence in IPV. But just because someone's drinking doesn't mean that they're going to become violent on that given occasion. And so trying to figure out when and in whom and in what situations, et cetera, is, is, is really what we're trying to do in this area and, and is, again, extraordinarily complicated. Um, to try to simplify it, uh, let's start kind of not necessarily focus on alcohol, but just when do people become violent? And, and one model that we use really breaks it down into trying to quantify people's urges to aggress and, and, and how strong those urges are. And those can be a result of being provoked, um, uh, you know, aggressive thoughts people might have, et cetera, different dispositions to become angry and so on and so forth. So those all kind of push people towards becoming aggressive. And the balance of those urges to aggress relative to people's ability to inhibit those urges. Um, so there's a lot of resilience factors or, uh, emotion regulation, different uh, skills or, or, or attributes that people have that allow them to inhibit. Um, uh, and essentially, when you look at that balance, you know, what, what wins? Um, uh, with respect to alcohol, uh, alcohol compromises people's ability to inhibit their behavior. Uh, one analogy we like to use is that alcohol doesn't cause uh, aggression or IPV by stepping on the gas pedal. Rather, it takes our foot off the brakes. Um, and kind of allows those urges to aggress that we have um, to really come out. Uh, and so, you know, when we try to answer the question of who's at risk, it's really, you know, in a given situation, uh, who, has, wh who has different individual factors and, and is in a situation with certain situational factors where the urges to aggress are going to override people's inhibitions to aggress. Um, with respect to the current pandemic, I think what we're seeing is that, you know, if you take alcohol out of the equation for a moment and, and look at the data that I presented, uh, people who are relatively light drinkers, um, they have much stronger urges to aggress as a result of COVID stress. And that's leading to um, uh, more IPV. Uh, what we also see in those data, and which is consistent with uh, data you know, pre-pandemic, which is that people who drink a lot more heavily uh, are, at, are at pretty high risk for IPV perpetration um, because they are compromising their inhibitory capacity. So even kind of more minimal stressors or urges to uh, aggress are going to kind of come out because their inhibitions are compromised. Thank you, uh, Dr. Parat, for that answer to that question. That was very interesting. Now, I would like to ask the group um, an additional question or two that were sent to us prior to the webinar. I read somewhere that in some places, IPV has decreased, but lethality has increased during the pandemic. Can you comment on this? And I'm going to go first to Dr. Evans. Thanks so much, Sharon. So um, just to follow up on, on previous conversations that we were having, um, as I mentioned at the outset, one in three women will experience physical, sexual, or psychological violence in her lifetime. So that's a huge number of people. And what we know is that intimate partner violence can occur in all countries. It does occur in all countries all over the world, um, across racial groups, and across socioeconomic status. Um, one of the things that's happening with COVID is that some of the antecedents or some of the risk factors for violence perpetration are being exacerbated. And so those things include things like social isolation. So the very thing that we are encouraging from a public health perspective, social distancing, is also a risk factor for violence, for experiencing violence and for perpetrating violence. Um, we also know that unemployment has gone through the roof in Georgia the unemployment rate has gone up 400% since the pandemic began. So these are some factors that are being exacerbated. One of the things that happens within relationships where violence is present is that violence increases over time in both frequency and severity. And so while we don't have specific data about increases in lethality, I mentioned some data from Brazil about femicides 
Again, those are anecdotal data collected over a very short period of time. Um, but we do know generally that when there is violence present within a relationship, that it's likely to increase over time and it's likely to increase in severity. And these additional factors that are being exacerbated by the COVID pandemic may be making that worse. So that's really something and one of the reasons why we really need to be collecting data during this period and intervening in this period with additional resources um, to help people that are in challenging situations. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, our second question is, what types of data are considered and how do the local trends, including resource allocations, fare nationally? Um, this time I'm going to start with Dr. Parat. Sure, so we uh, really tried to look at the literature on this um, and uh, you know, some of the data we were able to pull, uh, we weren't able to see as much, um, I guess, locally or regionally. Uh, we looked at, uh, tried to look at some international data. So I know this is um, not slightly in the realm of the question, uh, but uh, countries across the world on every continent were seeing reports of increases since the onset of the pandemic in those locales anywhere from 30 to 50 percent increases in IPV. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, from those data that there's really a question of whether or not um, the IPV, IPV is increasing. Um, what I do think we should consider to be somewhat tentative is how much it's increasing. Um, uh, because again, these data are just starting to emerge uh, and kind of systematic methods are, are just you know, starting to be used. And I think we need some more time to have more confidence in those rates. Uh, plus it's a moving target uh, in the sense that you know, just in the United States, you know, many states had uh, quarantine or shelter in place restrictions for you know, maybe a month and a half, um, some longer than others. But then as states start to open up, um, does that change what the trends look like? Uh, and, I, and I don't think we, we quite know that yet. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I think that one thing we need to keep in mind is that uh, to the extent that there are uh, strong shelter in place restrictions and whatnot, um, you know, the, my sense, and this is a subjective sense, is that the rates are probably higher than initial reports. Uh, when you see after natural disasters and whatnot, um, uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, IPV rates, I think after like Hurricane Katrina, for instance, in terms of psychological abuse, it might have increased 30 to 40% or something like that. Um, but with COVID, there may, I think there's much more, um, there's much stronger uh, uh, separation from victims and the resources that they can access over a longer period of time. And so that's just one example where we may see somewhere down the line that these rates are much higher, but I think time will tell on that. Great, thank you. Would um, either of the other panelists like to comment on this question? So one thing I'll just add is that even though I think that data are really important, um, and I truly do believe that, and I agree with Dr. Parat that we need more data. We, we also know enough to act. And so what I really want to do is issue a call to action um, for those that are donors or, um, you know, acting in, in um, government or within federal agencies and, and state and local agencies that we know enough to act and we should be allocating resources to partners who are community-based partners to be able to support people that are experiencing violence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, now I'm going to ask um, our uh, manager, research, uh, research manager, Ashley Singleton, um, if she has uh, any questions from the chat box. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all panelists for being here and all of our attendees. We do have several questions in the chat box, and we have about 15 minutes left in our, our webinar, so we'll get started. Um, Dominic, the first question for you is just a little bit of clarification on the study participants. Um, this person would like to know, does your study represent 
an increase in new offenders? And if not, have you seen any data showing that there has been an increase in new offenders? Um, the, the, the short answer to both those questions, I think, is, is no. So our study wasn't designed, we didn't ask questions to, well, I'll have to think about that. The data I presented don't speak to new offenders, I'll say that. Um, I don't think we had asked questions to get at new offenders. No, we did. We, we could find that out, but I don't know the answer to that at the moment because we could certainly tell whether someone didn't report any IPV in the last six months. And then if they did report IPV during the post COVID onset period, um, that wouldn't technically get at a truly new offender because someone could have offended a year or two prior and we would not have that data. So it's a little nuanced in that regard. Um, and I guess in response to the second question, I'm not aware of any data with regard to new offenders uh, in the post uh, COVID onset period. Okay. And similarly, will your, um, will your study continue now that it seems like shelter in place, at least in some areas, will continue over a few months? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, so our, our study was kind of a snapshot moment in time, um, cross-sectional study from a research panel. And so we're, we don't have a, a mechanism to kind of go back and follow those people over time. Um, uh, we don't have any immediate plans to collect new data from a new sample at some point later in the calendar year, although that would certainly be a possibility, but it wouldn't be tracking the exact same participants uh, over time. Okay, thank you. Okay, this question uh, is for anyone who'd like to respond on the panel. Uh, how can we use the information presented today to help students who are returning to college campuses and who um, may have come from an abusive environments. I'll take a stab. Um, so I think that, you know, some of the tools that I mentioned at the outset are valuable for anyone. And I think that um, one of the things that all of us can do is to be aware of just how prevalent violence is within our society. I think in this particular moment, we're aware of racial violence, but um, we really have a problem with violence in this country. And some of the, the norms that we have, gender norms that we have that are really problematic. So I mentioned those couple of tools at the outset which are really tools for people to be able to assess their own risk and make a plan. Um, but I think that there are professionals whose job it is to respond to survivors and issues of disclosure are really important. You know, most, most people that are experiencing violence within their relationship, they may not necessarily want the relationship to end. They want the violence to end. And so I think that we need to be really careful about, um, asserting our beliefs about what people need to do in their relationships onto them. Um, people that are experiencing violence are adults and they can make their own decisions and we can provide them with tools, for example, about safety planning so that they can make their own choices and as a society provide resources and support for people that do decide to leave those relationships. Great, thank you. Um, Ashley, um, this is Dr. Neep. Um, I would also like to respond to that uh, just a little bit. Um, many college campus, campuses have a office, and I know at our campus um, at Emory, it's called the Office of Respect, um, that specifically deal with um, relationship violence and um, intimate partner violence. So I think it is also good to take a look at um, what services may already be available on those campuses and connect with those offices. Um, they, I know the um, office that um, on our campus does a great job at providing um, some actual information and counseling services for students on campus. Thank you for letting me make that comment. Great, thanks, Sharon. I would also just like to um, 
pump up uh, Project Nia over at Grady. Um, there's an online referral you can make for someone who's not necessarily in acute crisis, and we often do send several of our patients that way. Excellent, thank you, Michael. Um, this next question, Michael, is actually for you. Um, how do we help survivors get the medical attention they may need? Well, that's an excellent, excellent question, thank you. Um, and this is something that has come up as we have uh, done a lot of the work around human trafficking, and that's to keep in mind that often um, the presentation of the patient is for something other than domestic violence or human trafficking. And so, uh, again, focusing on that patient-centered experience, um, keeping in mind that we don't want to be only focused um, on the disposition or the safe discharge, but also what brought them to the ER today? Um, and are they having pain? Like, are they having abdominal pain? Are they having any other medical components that need to be worked up and um, adequately treated? And I also uh, want to make sure that, you know, that the highlighting of the difficulties in the ER doesn't come across as in any way disparaging to our ER or discouraging, because if there's anyone who needs medical or help with this, we are there and, and we will, um, we have wonderful clinicians who will be able to help with, with both components. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have many more questions in the chat box, but unfortunately we are running out of time. Um, but we will take note of these questions and try our best to provide you all with some responses after the webinar. Great, thank you, Ashley. Um, I am going to um, ask one additional question, um, and that is, and this is to the panel, how do we prevent, how do, how do we do prevention work online when people aren't living in a safe home? What are practical tips and approaches? And I believe I'm gonna direct this to Dr. Evans. Thanks, Sharon. So I mentioned a couple of tools, and I think um, one of the things that's really important for us to recognize, especially during this pandemic period, is that people are isolated at home, and they may be isolated at home with people um, that they are in a violent relationship with, perpetrators of violence. So it may not be safe for them to, um, to reach out for information or to disclose what they're experiencing. But there are some tools that people can access. So I mentioned a couple of things, um, which are online tools, specifically the My Plan app, which is a safe app um, and has some security protections to it, as well as the Danger Assessment, which is an online app. So I know that um, as people have been undergoing shelter in place, that it has been very difficult for them um, to be able to reach out for resources. But this, for me, really underscores um, why safety planning is so important. You know, for someone that may be experiencing violence in their relationship, thinking about leaving that relationship during a pandemic may just seem like an added burden. And, you know, things are already hard. So why leave now? And that's why I think that safety planning is so important so that people can really make their own decisions in the time that works for them, but be prepared to do so in a, in a way that is uh, supported. So I really encourage those resources that I previously shared. Great, great, thank you. Sharon, could I yes, uh, also take a stab at that? Yeah, and, and from a slightly different angle, because um, uh, Dr. Evans's comments focused uh, kind of well, well, on, on victims and what they can do in terms of planning and so forth. And, and, and I think it's also important to think about the, the question of prevention from the perpetrators, uh, to focus on perpetrators. And I'm not so much talking about uh, frequent, severe perpetration, um, uh, but more on, uh, you know, people who might not have been perpetrating, but then the stress at what, and whatnot is kind of spilling over uh, into the relationship. And how do we reach them? Um, and how do we prevent IPV? How do we help them regulate that stress from a distance? Uh, and one thing that researchers have been working on for some time now, going back a few years, is remotely delivered interventions through smartphones, text messaging, et cetera, that can provide uh, kind of evidence-based, theoretically informed messages to help people cope, whether it's with stress or to help them regulate emotion, to uh, tolerate distress. Uh, 
um, uh, reduce their drinking, et cetera. Um, and one thing that we're hoping to do in the future is uh, test out these uh, text messaging interventions uh, for IPV. One thing we did in our study that I reported on, but we haven't had the time yet to go through the data, is some of those participants um, received text messages during the pandemic of the kind that I described. Um, and we'll be analyzing those data to determine whether or not it actually helped reduce their IPV during the pandemic. So this is preliminary, it's tentative, it's not available kind of to the public, but you know, this is one potential avenue for prevention in the future to reach people remotely, whether it's during a pandemic um, or in any other sort of situation where access to care is more difficult. Thank you, Dr. Parat, for that answer. This discussion has been very helpful to all of us. And I would like you to please respond to a brief poll that you will see on your screen as, as your feedback will help us to improve future webinars. And it has been my pleasure to be your moderator for today. And also, um, we would love to have your feedback to improve future webinars. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you soon.